Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dan Banik and thanks to uh, Ude for inviting me to give this talk. I find myself in Malawi, but I was very pleased to record this on Friday uh, before leaving. Congratulations on this new uh, division at, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think this will be fascinating uh, for us to follow uh, the work that you will be doing. So I've been told to give a snappy, short 10 minute uh, talk. Uh, so let me give you the three minute uh, tour first of the evolution of the concept of sustainable development, followed by some practical examples uh, based on the work that we are doing here at the University of Oslo, where we have established something called the Oslo SDG Initiative. Uh, I'll be talking about certain case studies uh, in Africa and Asia, and I'll conclude with, uh, with certain observations uh, regarding the overarching debates and some of the interesting questions that maybe you could uh, debate after, after hearing me. So uh, let's get cracking. The first set of issues has to do with the, the concept of sustainable development. Most of you, of course, are familiar, as is everyone else, that uh, the, the concept really took off after the Brundtland Commission's report in 1987, Our Common Future, where sustainable de uh, development was defined about taking care of our current needs, but also with an eye on the future needs of future generations and without compromising their needs. Um, but it turns out it's not just 1987 that was the watershed mo moment. There was also a 1972 conference in Stockholm uh, and followed by the Brundtland Commission's report that garnered a lot of international attention. There have been a lot of uh, United Nations uh, processes uh, in Rio, Joburg, Rio Plus 20, culminating in 2015 where the concept received some sort of a rejuvenation uh, when the 2030 agenda and the 17 accompanying SDGs were uh, established and agreed to by 193 world leaders. But what is particularly interesting is to trace the, the, the evolution in the sense that you have elements of norm uh, promotion and goals, uh, the global goal setting project, uh, but you also have this uh, distinction between environment slash development moving to environment and development. So you suddenly had this more of a closer integration of the developmental and the environmental agendas. And what is particularly interesting today is to go back to the 1987 Brundtland Commission's report, Our Common Future, where development was actually defined both in terms of human needs uh, but also they introduced the idea of limits, that we have to address the growing problem of world poverty. Uh, poverty uh, reduction is still a major challenge today. But what is particularly interesting when you reflect on the Brundtland Commission's report is that they were emphasizing human needs, they were talking about limitations, but they were also talking about the key role of economic growth. It was more about making growth more environmental friendly. Um, towards the end of this 10 minute presentation, you'll hear me saying that perhaps that has been one of the big challenges that is being debated now. So 2015, uh, we have the 2030 agenda, which is pretty impressive. You have all of these people uh, in the world, uh, the world leaders reaching a consensus, agreeing to 17 goals that relate to both the developmental and the environmental agendas. We're talking about very uh, interesting new, uh, even controversial goals like SDG 16 on governance. We're talking about inequality reduction. Who would have thought? that the international community would actually agree to a goal on inequality reduction as an SDG 10. There's been a focus uh, also on consumption, sustainable consumption, uh, energy, economic growth, decent, uh, de decent work. Uh, we're talking about the whole spectrum of developmental and environmental challenges. We're talking about climate issues, environment, but also growth and poverty reduction. So where are we? Well, if you have a look at the, uh, the document, the 2030 Agenda, it is pretty impressive. It talks about there's a preamble, uh, setting um, forth very ambitious goals, talking about transformations, radical transformations uh, that are needed to achieve these goals. Uh, we're talking about the means of implementation, the 
uh, the document actually talks about finance, trade, technology, capacity building, and the whole role of partnerships. And I think this is particularly interesting uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to talk about how it can facilitate this kind of partnerships and the so-called means of implementation. Uh, and there's also um, in the document this whole thing about following up through the high-level political forum, where of course Norway is going to ma play a major role this year in July. Um, and also the role of indicators and measurements. So basically, just to sum up this section, it's been a fantastic journey. Uh, the, the concept of sustainable development has ebbed and flowed. It received a lot of attention in 1987 and the following years, but then it actually um, went into oblivion and it received some sort of a boost uh, following uh, 2015. In between, of course, you also had the Millennium Development Goals that were accused of not necessarily uh, addressing the environmental challenges enough. But now we have the SDGs, a fantastic uh, uh, platform to address these numerous challenges. So that was the three or four minute tour of the evolution of the sustainable development concept. Okay, so it turns out I spent more than three minutes. It was actually six. That's, that's how it is with academics. So I'll have to cut down the next few sections. Uh, the second uh, issue that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, based on some of the research we're doing here, uh, looking at country case studies. And there are two sets of actors, I would say, that have really embraced the SDGs. One is, of course, big business. Uh, I've never seen the private sector embrace the development agenda as much or as well or as closely and tightly as big businesses. You see that in Norway. We see that in India, in China, in many other parts of the world, in the UK. You have Unilever, you have activist CEOs talking about the right thing to do. Uh, we're talking about social entrepreneurship. I, I've been talking to a lot of Norwegian business leaders of late. Telenor is talking about it. Fad is talking about it. Yara is talking about it. So you have that. Uh, there's some criticism that medium and, and uh, smaller businesses haven't embraced it enough. There aren't any incentives, incentives enough. And I'm sure um, uh, you'll have uh, some discussion about this later on. But the big story, I think, is that or the takeaway is that big businesses have embraced it. Um, there is some criticism that uh, they have ba basically been cherry picking the goals, uh, you know, suiting their business needs. There's criticism that uh, they've been advocating the idea that it's only based on profits. That without the profit-making incentive, businesses would not be involved uh, in the uh, sustainable development uh, business, uh, so to speak. Uh, there's also a, a very clear pattern emerging from private businesses that if you reduce the, if you take away the profit incentive, there is no incentive to take part. A uh, related goal, uh, a related uh, criticism again is the fact that the idea of sustainable development, as is being promoted by business, is that you have to have sustained continued economic growth and you can achieve sustainable development only if you also have growth. This is being contested by civil society and the private sector. And one final issue that you may want to consider is that I still think businesses are talking about grand declarations or this is important, we should be doing this. Uh, concrete operationalization or actually even talking about the counterfactual. How would they have done their businesses before uh, they embrace the sustainable development goals? How are they changing practices? What is coming out of it? That is um, something that I'm yet to see. So there's a lot of talk, but a little less, or perhaps uh, what one should be doing more is operationalizing the concept better. The second uh, group of actors that have been really embracing the agenda are big emerging countries, India and China. So Xi Jinping and uh, Narendra Modi came back from the UN in 2015 and have basically told their uh, regional, their national, regional and local um, governments that you have to do this. And we see this operationalized in terms of national action plans in China. There's a lot of talk about green growth. There's a lot of talk about sustainable development. And we've been interacting with many of the think tanks, the official think tanks that are promoting this idea. And I don't have time to get into this, but China is really promoting and uh, the idea that its very ambitious Belt and Road program, as you're aware of, is basically 
uh, the same. The principles of the Belt and Road Program and the SDGs are the same. So by uh, agreeing to sustainable development and promoting the SDGs, you're also promoting the Belt and Road. So this is a very suave diplomatic move uh, from China, as you also see in terms of their growing influence in the UN. India is doing the same. I've been attending national workshops and sessions with uh, civil servants from all the various uh, states of India where there's a lot of talk about operationalizing the SDGs, in, in fact developing their own indicators to measure progress. So they're actually using naming and shaming the ranking states within India in terms of each sustainable development goal and basically uh, saying that some states should be doing much more than others. We see also some of this happening in Rwanda, a lot of enthusiasm uh, Paul Kagame and his charismatic leadership uh, has been really promoting the idea of sustainable development. They've created something called the SDG Center for Africa in Kigali. Uh, I was giving a talk there uh, uh, recently and they were really keen on promoting the idea of green growth. They're electrifying cars, they're manufacturing stuff, uh, electric bikes, is a, a lot of talk. But there's also the other side of the coin, Malawi where I find myself now, uh, which is basically saying uh, we don't have the money. So, you know, we want to do this, but come on, you know, who's going to pay for it? We really haven't started planning. So that is basically how it is. Big businesses have embraced it. Some major uh, uh, countries have embraced it, but many other countries are still struggling. So where are we then in terms of the debates? Let me highlight uh, a few debates that you may wish to discuss uh, later on in this afternoon. One I've already highlighted, which relates to financing and the role of the private sector. Uh, the UN has put a lot of faith in the private sector, but we haven't seen it uh, materialize as much in terms of really supplementing aid, supplementing national taxation, etc. And this is where Malawi is particularly interesting. Uh, they're not necessarily able to attract private sector investments. And so they're wondering oh, which sequence, what should we be trading off? How can we achieve all of these? Um, the OECD has been doing some work on uh, logical sequencing. They, they've interviewed lots of people and they're saying maybe we should be prioritizing certain goals before others. Uh, so inequality, for example, uh, hunger perhaps uh, doesn't come high up on the list. So all kinds of debates are going on in terms of the logical sequencing and trade-offs. A very important uh, uh, debate which is taking place also in Norway is this whole idea of policy coherence. Uh, and I was uh, privileged to be a part of the launch of the Norwegian Action Plan on, on Sustainable Food Systems last, uh, last summer. And I think it is a fantastic example of many ministries actually collaborating together. Uh, but it'll be pretty interesting to see how these seven ministries of five actually having formulated the program go about implementing it. So to what extent uh, can one actually ensure that various departments stop thinking in silos? Uh, the silo thinking actually continues also in academia as you all know. I was giving a talk to Norwegian civil society organizations and I asked them how has, has this 2030 agenda and the SDGs changed your way of thinking? Are you collaborating more? And there was absolute silence. So people aren't really using this agenda to collaborate more even though uh, collaboration is required. So ensuring policy coherence across sectors, uh, much more partnerships uh, across disciplines is the need of the R. To the extent to which that can happen is really uh, uh, the question. But also the most important I would say uh, thing that is missing in this whole debate is the politics the politics of the SDGs. And this is really my main um, argument in the sense that I feel everybody talks about everything happening as if it's going to happen without any sacrifices. Is this kind of win-win rhetoric that the Chinese have been promoting for a while? I think that is creeping through in the sustainable development discourse. Everything is fine. Let's not talk about the controversial aspects. And, and this is where academics are, of course, a little frustrated because development per se is a contested idea. Development per se is about prioritization. And um, when I was talking to many of my colleagues in India, for example, they would say, uh, you guys are talking about fifth floor issues. We're still stuck in first floor issues. We have all of these problems uh, about resource, resource allocation, minorities, etc., that are not resolved. And until we resolve these current challenges, we can't address these uh, future challenges. And why should we? 
uh, think about future generations. They, aren't, they, they haven't even been born. So that itself is where I see some of the problems. And you see this in terms of the Facebook group that has been created in Norway against climate change. So there's a lot of this happening. People are really questioning, come on, you know, we also have to have a good life. So the politics of the SDGs, and I think what we really should be trying to better understand is what will it take to to ensure this kind of behavioral change mindset, not just among politicians, but also among us as consumers. Some of it is happening, but in many parts of the world where there is, of course, there are some of the greatest challenges that is not happening fast enough. And even though President Xi and Prime Minister Modi may be talking about this uh, from the national uh, ar ar arena, it is not necessarily getting a lot of traction bottom up. Finally, um, this question about what should we be doing and this role of economic growth. There's a lot of talk about degrowth um, among students and other activists, but uh, I was chatting with Martin Wolf, the influential um, uh, columnist from the Financial Times. He was here last week. We were attending the Oslo Energy Forum. And a lot of the debates were pretty fascinating because you do see the private sector, the oil companies, Equinor, Dutch Shell, they're all changing, talking about you know becoming carbon neutral. Uh, all of these ambitious goals and targets are being set for 2050. That is fascinating. I see that is that is something really positive. But Martin Wolf, was also very sure that the, the problem, uh, sure about one thing, the problem is that we really as humans always want more. We want more of everything. And, and, and Martin says that basically it's the capitalist system that has been the best at, at granting that and facilitating that. Without the capitalist system, uh, there is no other system that actually has that kind of a track record. And, uh, but the problem with the capitalist system is of course we want more. And so it is this growth model. And unless we either change and radically adapt, um, which he thinks is unlikely, we're not really going to make much progress. And the biggest uh, problem uh, he sees, uh, and, and, and I agree with him, is that the major emissions, two thirds of the emissions are coming from emerging countries like India and China. And as much as we should be doing things in Norway, a lot of the problems and challenges are related to that kind of stuff. Nobody is really in these countries willing to trade off their poverty for something else. They don't want to be locked in to a permanent case of relative poverty. And unless we address that, this uh, relationship between emissions and relative poverty, uh, it's, Martin and many others say we should be preparing for heroic uh, sacrifice and perhaps lots of crises. So thank you for having me. Tusen tack. Gratulerer Katja. Tusen tack Håkon for invitation. Beklager at dette ble litt lengre, men det ville vært enda lengre hadde jeg snakket på norsk. Like til.